You may notice as the film starts, after our blush of really quite wonderful logos, um, <laughs> each and every one of which I think is a very moving piece of art, <laughs> it says, based on a hundred true stories. And maybe if I share the first story with you, the thing that sort of called this subject to my attention, because I was watching TV news, not much on, and then suddenly there was a breaking headline, and it said that in Miami, an army planning a full-scale ground war on the United States had just been arrested by the FBI. And the Attorney General was making this announcement and proudly saying that the, the nation had been saved. And does anyone, does this ring a bell with anyone? Um, I thought, I mean this was all the lead on, on British TV news, and I thought, yeah, Jesus Christ, bet it is. I mean, a full ground war on the United States? What's going on? Two years later in the trial, it turned out that this vicious warrior army was uh, seven construction workers from Miami who planned to take over Chicago by riding in on horses. <laughs> now, they didn't have the money to get to Chicago, they didn't have any weapons, they didn't even have any horses. <laughs> but they had been represented as the biggest threat to America, the al biggest Al-Qaeda threat to America since 9-11. And I thought, okay, what's going on? It, it, it seemed that basically what had happened was that they'd fallen in with an FBI informant who'd offered them $50,000 to come up with a plan. And their first plan was, we want to lead a protest to the governor's house to protest about conditions in the projects. And the informant said, no, you're not gonna get your 50 grand for that. You have to think of something bigger. Could you destroy a building or something? And the leader of this, these construction workers said, well, I come from Chicago, and you know what? I know how to blow up the Sears Tower. We'll knock it into the lake, we'll cause a tidal wave that will swamp the city, and then we'll ride it on horses. <laughs> these guys were all found guilty and sent to jail on charges of terrorism. True story. And, and I thought, well, this must be a one-off. And then I just started looking, and it turned out that this is a drip, drip, drip of these cases, sort of about one a month. And the, the, the details are incredible. There was some, up, some guys in upstate New York who were offered, who had to be offered $250,000 before they agreed to come up with a plan to blow up a bomb. Even then they said, well, we only want to blow it up at night so that no one gets hurt. On the day of the bombing, they forgot how to set up the bomb so that the informant had to do it for them. <laughs> they went to jail for 25 years. And in the summing up, the judge said, only the government could have turned these guys into terrorists. It's actually on the record. So these are the kinds of stories that pitched me into this sort of journey which ended up in making this film. Uh, now most of the cast are here tonight. And, yeah. uh, and we'll be up here afterwards to, to ask questions. So please enjoy the film. Did you pick up that yellow? Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> because I don't really feel myself anymore unless I'm doused in kerosene, kerosene holding a zippo. Um, see you later. Thank you very much. Somebody much cleverer than me said that the difference between comedy and tragedy is that with comedy you get a second chance. So if you're following the consequences of all these actions, I guess you're going in one direction. And ultimately it would be, I guess, a lie to the stories that I was talking about at the start. 
if you didn't hit the wall at the end. So I think you can sort of have both because they, if you play it for real, they do remain in sync. And essentially he has a lot of second chances until the last one. So the two are entirely compatible, so I feel it in terms of theory. <laughs> I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about the casting process, because it's such an amazing, I mean everyone, I'm sure you'll agree, everyone in this film is just incredible. Well, it would be very funny to hear how it sounded from the other side. It wasn't really so much casting as, as meetings and trying things out. And basically, it was, it, it was fantastic. I mean, I think the first time Marshawn came in, he sat on a table, and he did that scene where he's sitting on the table and it just, you know, it just changes from these scrappy words that you've written on a page to this magical thing and even in a sort of, with, with no costume and no lighting and everything, you just go boom. And when Anna came in, it was the same, the, the sort of, it was a version of the scene with, where she's trying to stop the police guy going after the nukes that she knows doesn't exist and it was just like, it just made me laugh. It was. Fantastic, hilarious, and each time we did it, Anna did something different. And again, I just thought, oh my god, you know, this lives. And it was the same really with everyone. It's the same thing that you're looking for. And they're, so they're not really auditions, they're just kind of, can we play for a bit now and see what happens? And it was just right down the line, that's how it was. So I kind of take, I mean, everyone here and the, Dennis, who's in London, a couple of other people who you're not seeing tonight, they just make your sort of, what on a grey day looks like something you should just chuck in the bin, they turn it into a living, breathing thing. And then, on set it just got better. I mean, I can't, I honestly can't, I could go on for a very long time and gush about this, but it is actually true that when you're there and you see it in a monastery, you just think, Jesus, can we just do more and more of this because I don't know what's happened, but this, this person's just caught fire. Can we just do more? It's really, and I think that was the case with every single one of these people here, including Kate. I think so much of the, the joy of this film is uh, just watching people uh, talk to each other and, and banter, riff off each other. It's, it's really like a magical thing to watch. And how much of a uh, how much of a change was that from the script stage to the finished film? It was. It's a banter movie. It's what it is. It's top bats. Um, a change. Well, there's there's. Some things you could say, I mean, I was talking to Jess about this this morning, so some things have been nailed down since early versions and some things change. Basically, I think everybody gives something from their sort of golden area, so whether, whether it's a spontaneous remark, Kay Van's very good at just saying things that aren't on the page at all without asking, he just throws things in. You know, everybody does it in a different way. Um, and everybody, you just feel that everybody's going in the right direction, so, you know, Marshawn would ask questions to suggest the first day you and Danielle came in and with the, the first scene we shot, you both said, Hey, we've hey, we've worked out a little thing, should we try it? And just think, okay, we're already cooking on day one. So you definitely want to have that. You know, so many things that Anna suggested. I mean everybody basically on set goes, I thought of this, or should we try this? And you go, Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So you end up catching sometimes it makes things seem more real because the rhythm of the dialogue is broken a bit. And sometimes it's just a funny thing. That many of the laughs, are, you know, are made that way. It's, it's a fresh, you, you want to keep a freshness even in the sort of 100 degree heat or whatever, don't you? It's enough for me. Um, yeah. It's like, you know, it also makes me think about the Black Santa moment where a man, <laughs> no man who plays Razor, comes in to try to talk to me and Danielle. Uh, and Chris had asked me, it was, they were trying to figure out something to do in that moment, and I told him that whenever my mom used to buy a Santa Claus for Christmas or an angel for Christmas, we would play that, we would paint it black <laughs> before we put it on the Christmas tree. Because we had to. <laughs> so, so that went in there, I was shocked. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely an amazing moment. And, uh, I wonder if you talk, uh, asking the cast members too, um, how did you respond to this project when it was first presented to you? Because it is definitely a, an unconventional film, but um, you know, for you, what was it that you responded to when you first were presented with it? Um, to be honest, uh, I think sometimes Chris is too smart for himself even, and there were times when I had to read a scene two or three times just to understand what was going on, 
And then when we got to the table read, it's really what Chris was saying earlier, that like watching these amazing people do things, I was like, not only do I understand it now, I'm laughing and I'm moved and it's, it's absolutely incredible. And Anna had the boyfriend test, which was like, say, when I tried to explain this to my boyfriend, he didn't have a clue, so we're definitely gonna have to clarify. Way to throw my boyfriend under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you said? That was kind of like, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was good, it was great. <laughs> it was good. It, 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 so, you know, everything, you just go, yeah, there's about four ideas here in one minute, and it'd be much better if you just stuck to the original, you know, the key one, and then you make things work that way. So it's, you know, it is a live process, the whole, I also wanted to ask, because you know, you talk, you, at the beginning you talked about some of the stories you were looking at and you inspired by, I think, 100 stories. Um, you want the other 98? <laughs> if, if you could, yeah, that'd be great. Um, well, no, I was just going to ask, like, what were some of the stories, or were there any stories you considered too absurd to include in this film? Because it's, it's already got some absurd moments. So what, what was left off the table? Well, I mentioned some, I sort of deliberately mentioned some pretty absurd ones at the start. Um, they, some of them are just sad, but what's consistently ridiculous is the degree to which they're pushed. And it wasn't so much about looking into those real stories to include actual elements in the film, it was just to see how the structure of those cases work. And you sort of have to understand them because these guys have a job, the FBI have a job, after 9-11 they task themselves with looking after the homeland, and it's a very difficult thing to do, and they've accidentally discovered that it's harder to catch the real guys than it is to lead some people on and get them convicted of terrorism. And their answer, their question to themselves is always, well, so if they have a Moses type person and they say, well, is he dangerous? And am I going to be the person that says, no, he's not dangerous? And then what happens down the line if he is? So just by that sort of straightforward career management process, you get these things and it becomes ridiculous for those kind of reasons, that they just, you think you should be saying no. There was a case in Portland where a guy uh, went to the FBI and said, I'm worried that my son is becoming radicalized. And the FBI said, that's good, we know how to deal with this, we got this. And then spent a year winding him up until he was prepared to try and blow up a truck bomb. And you sort of think, could you spend a year doing something else that would have meant that he sort of ended up, you know, going around giving everybody Christmas presents? You know, you've got a year to work on this and you've got a lot of dollars to spend on it. What are you going to do? So, you know, just, that, the, the stories inform the shape, and they allow you to create a fiction within the realm of what's possible, technically. Do you, um, this is a bit of a loaded question, maybe, but do you see it as a political film at all? Do you see it as a political film at all? <laughs> I think yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's <laughs> I mean, I guess part of the challenge of a film like this is maintaining that balance of, you know, what is political and, you know, st statement-driven, and just, you know, making a, an amazing, funny, um, <laughs> at times, like, pretty, quite slapstick film. Um, I mean, can you talk about the slapstick nature of it? Because that's one of the things that really... Well, can I talk a bit about, because, I, I mean, people, like, I think, I remember Angel Curtis, but there were sort of conversations where people were kind of saying, I think Angel did you say, in my family can be really angry or there was the things where there was kind of the feeling of it having some relation to real life was was sort of in there even when we were doing things like you know we were doing things which were joke versions but they all came from real things so you're always trying to justify i think the best jokes come from the most sort of real behavior within the circumstances that you've set up and therefore Slapstick, I mean, it, it, there's, there's not much true slapstick in there, but there's just things which are physically committed. I mean, what, Kayvan, this Kayvan jumping up, I mean, it's like, you know, there are, some people just look ridiculous. He was, he wasn't quite <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, you should ask these guys, because they, they probably thought, you know, they would have thoughts about their clowning skills. <laughs> what are your thoughts about your clowning skills? <laughs> but no, really, I'd like, could you talk a little bit about the process of work on this film and how that dynamic came about? Um, ah, uh, it was, I can't really say clowning, because from the moment we read the script, we understood what we were stepping into. And for me, being black, I completely understand that this is something that happened, and it had to be taken care of with a lot of 
care, a lot of understanding, and I think the approach that Chris thankfully took with it was to bring this to the audience so that way they could see it and understand and swallow this really hard pill through the lens that is a little bit more comfortable, like comedy. Um, getting ready for something like this was pretty extreme, just because I'm not a violent person <laughs> on that degree. Um, I don't think any of us are. I think Danielle, Marshawn, Curtis, Malcolm, and I, we, we really tried to make sure that although we were playing a very high stakes, we kept real, and I think we did that um, pretty well. <laughs> I will say something. All right, I'm gonna say something. <laughs> um, on that note, like, and also I had to get on board with the kind of comedy that I was stepping into as well, um, and researching the writers and the director. Um, British comedy is just a little bit different than American comedy. Um, that's what I came to realize. <laughs> <laughs> and it for sure made me uncomfortable at first, but I just had to understand. I had to study a little bit more and to really understand where it kind of comes from. And I, I was second what Andre was saying. I felt like I knew where we were trying to get to. I knew what I was trying to say with my performance, um, something that I agreed on with my castmates as well. And I felt like this is a really good way to do it. It's a good way to put some medicine in the candy. You feel me? Um, and I think I think we were kind of successful at it. <laughs> yeah. You do this for a living. <laughs> uh, okay, can I just, can I say, um, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> I want to say one of my favorite parts was uh, uh, when we were wrapping up well, one of the last two nights, we were eating in the middle of the night and I was across from Kayvon and the topic of LSD had come up uh, as we we're just eating our late night dinner. And this was after, this was between scenes where he had the arrow in his head. <laughs> Um, and he's eating right across the table from me, and um, we, I was I, and I was going like, yeah, LSD. Everybody's done it. He looked up with an arrow on his head and was like, I've never done LSD. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the accidental magical moments. <laughs> I think you were microdosing most of the time, James. Right? <laughs> Still. <laughs> I mean, obviously this is the world premiere, and I'm wondering, uh, I'm, I'm curious how, to know how it's going to be received in the wider world, like what are some of your expectations for how audiences are going to receive it? Because it is a provocative film. You want me to lay out <laughs> a very clear eyed prediction of how audiences will receive. How many audiences do you want me to second guess? <laughs> All of them, if you can. Okay, that's... I mean, there are, there are, strangely enough, people in this room who will probably have very hard-boiled professional opinions about that <laughs> question. I have no idea. I mean, I've written, you know, you, you can't possibly gainsay an audience. We, we, you know, you just, uh, at this stage, you're, you're kind of letting go of the balloon and seeing what happens. So, uh, without sounding craven, it's up to you to, <laughs> to make it fly. We've done our well, I just want to say, uh, I'm afraid we have to wrap it up there, but I just want to say thank you so much, and thanks to uh, this amazing group of people. Um,